this is the reality is that we often have hiccups so I appreciate everybody's patience uh, this session is being recorded so if you choose to leave your cameras off totally understandable but if you choose to leave them on that's great just to let you know we are recording today so I'd like to begin my name is Natalie Beltrano and I'd like to first do a land acknowledgement that I am a visitor and a guest, as is the University of Windsor, here on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations. And that is comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. So I thank you for joining me today. This is my first time presenting for Gata Academy, so I'm really excited to be here. So to introduce myself, um, my name is Natalie. I am a student here at the University of Windsor. I'm a PhD student in social work. I graduated with my master's from the University of Calgary in 2017. There was me and my little cap and gown. Um, me and my partner, we are proud for parents to our girls. Uh, there's Abby, our St. Bernoodle. So her mom was a St. Bernard and her dad was a standard poodle. She is a psychiatric service animal. And then we got Zoe during COVID. So we call her our COVID baby. And she is our tiny destroyer. She keeps us very well entertained, but she definitely is the opposite of her sister. She is a handful. I became a researcher about three years ago and became passionate about research and hence that's why I'm doing my PhD and you'll notice that because I'm a social worker and I'm studying biases you're going to hear me talk a lot about social justice and biases as part of the effective discussions today. Personally, uh, I am an aunt to about 25 kids now, children, uh, the oldest being 27, so not really a child, and the youngest six months. And typically I'm called Aunt Nat or Aunt Nan or Nanny. And for self-care, I try to be a runner. I am slower than a turtle running in peanut butter, but I'm proud to say I've completed three half marathons and I'm training for the fall of this year um, to do a full. So that's a little bit about me. I'm very happy to have you here today and um, yeah, excited. So to start, we are gonna have a quick breakout session. Uh, you're just gonna be randomly put into groups. There's no need to record anything. Nobody needs to write notes. But we're here to talk about effective discussions and really what effective discussions are, are conversations. So in your group, uh, you'll have about four or five of you each. And I just want you to talk about what made a great conversation. So think back to like a year ago, last week, doesn't matter when. It could be academic, it could be with a family member, with your boss, doesn't matter. But think about a conversation that was great. And just with your group, four or five minutes, I'll send a message in the chat when we're coming back so you'll know we're coming back so you're not talking all the way through. And just again, what characteristics made a conversation great? So we're gonna head out into breakout groups. I will post the, com the question in the chat so you'll have that. And uh, I'll give you a message when we're coming back in. Okay? One, one thing I should... Oh. oh, shoot. That's okay. No, I, <laughs> I was actually just going to mention that um, because we still have about five people set as moderators, they don't get the benefit of, um, of joining the breakout rooms. Oh no, oh. So if they, if they. Are they here right now? If they unmute, we can have a chat about it. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we have Ahmed, we have Elnaz, uh, Joan, and Priyanka. Um, I see Ab yeah. Abdul, okay, we have two people who rejoined as participants. So um, if you want, you do you know how to manually add them to breakout rooms or would you like me to do that? If you, if you can do that, Liz, that would be great. Okay, for sure.
Hi, Liz. Is, can everybody hear me if I talk right now? Um, so we have two more participants in the main room. I'm trying to send them to break rooms right now. Okay. Three more, actually. Okay. Okay, it looks like it's just us in the main room right now. <laughs> yeah, no worries. I yeah, I don't want to take up too much time with this activity, so I don't no want worries. to. Speak. Yeah, um, but I just wrote you a question. I wasn't sure. Um, when I bring up a blank slide next, people mm -hmm. can use it as a whiteboard, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, awesome. Just wanted to make sure. So hopefully everyone's uh, <laughs> behaving. <laughs> um. <laughs> It'll be fine. I'm sure. It should be good. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to bring them back. I, after you just did all that work, um, I'm going to have them come back in a couple no of worries. No worries. This should be good. And then two. Hey everybody, we're back. Thank you for participating. And uh, I apologize if you weren't put into a group right away and, and the confusion and, and all of that, that's uh, part of the hiccups of technology. So anyways, I pulled up this slide and we're gonna use it as a whiteboard. And um, I just want you to take a chance and I know there's a lot of you in here, but if you could write on the whiteboard, just one or two things that you're hoping to achieve today. Why are you here? What made you sign up? Um, did somebody tell you you had to come? So just want to get an idea where everybody's at. Does anybody want to talk up or just mention like, why are you here today? Yeah, for me, uh Oh, thanks. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah please. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, why I'm here is, uh, um, I, I think it's important to to facilitate uh, discussion. Discussions are, I think, one of the main tools of learning for me. Uh, and I, I guess for my students, it's, it's a very uh, two-way conversation. Plus, you send out a message that the, the student's knowledge is as important as the instructor's knowledge is. And I'm not here to impart, uh, you know, some big ideas on to you but you actually have them in you and we need to bring those out so i i find it very enriching and i'm hoping for some new ideas here awesome great so building skills becoming more effective important to attend learn some new strategies i think the color is making it hard to see everybody's writing <laughs> learning to navigate online discussions. Well, as you can see, there's hiccups with online <laughs> stuff. Great. Okay, so a lot of your ideas about becoming more effective tutors, uh, tutorials, building online skills. So those fall in line with what we're here for today. Um, so this is our agenda and our objectives. So in an online environment, um, we need to learn what are effective discussions. So we need to provide a definition, not only for ourselves, but to make sure our students know what is an effective discussion. So what are they going to learn from this? And then once we know what an effective discussion is, we need to talk about how do we create a space to facilitate these effective discussions online, because our times have changed and shifting into this primarily online domain, it can be challenging. So, and then we're gonna talk about 
once we've created those safe spaces, how do we promote effective and discursive discussions? Because that's really why we're here. But if we don't know the definition and we don't have a safe space, we can't facilitate those effective discussions. And then finally, we're gonna talk about the managing dynamics and conflict in the online format. So this is our agenda. I know it is the end of the day, so we definitely are gonna take a break. Um, this is typically my nap time, so I know energy can be running a little bit low, so bear with me. Um, and if you have any questions that come up throughout this, post them in the chat, please. I'll try to keep my um, eye aware of what people are asking, if you have anything to interject. And we will get started on our first subject. So, I don't know if everybody's familiar with Mentimeter, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a word cloud. Um, so on Menti, you type in menti.com, and I will post the code now in the chat. And this is going to be a word cloud of our definition of how do you define effective discussions. So I wanna get a sense of where you're at. So I'm gonna share my screen, um, and we're gonna create this word cloud. So again, you go to www.menti.com and use that code 82702180. And you can do this on your phone or you can do it on a new tab. Um, but it's a great way to see what everybody thinks is an effective discussion. So, and if you're stuck, um, think back to those breakout rooms and what you talked about in there and what made a conversation great and consider those characteristics. So guided, structured, it's interesting, guided and structured, mutual, respectful, engaging, passionate, introduce new perspective, open, informative, connecting, structured, and guiding mutual, passionate, I love that word, passionate, kind, understanding others, non-judgmental, engaging, I can't speak, <laughs> reciprocal, <laughs> listening, absolutely, increases knowledge, all of these things, awesome, people are still typing, okay, helpful, dynamic, objective. All right, thank you. Oh gosh, constructive criticism. Absolutely safe. You're gonna hear me refer to safe a lot today because that's a huge part of effective discussions. Okay, all right. I don't mean to cut anybody off, but because we lost a bit of time in the beginning, I'm gonna move forward. So I'm just gonna stop sharing um, and go back to my um, PowerPoint. And uh, we're gonna talk about what the literature says about effective discussions. So the literature says there is no one simple definition of an effective discussion. So like a lot of things in academia, there's a lot of definitions. So like you, I've identified, it promotes critical thinking. So as a teacher, as a GA, as an academic, our goal is to promote higher order learning and critical thinking. And this can happen through effective discussions. So what we have in the textbook, what we are teaching in a theory, what we're teaching in a mathematical problem, we want it to translate into everyday life. So effective discussions help support that transfer of learning. So this is a lifelong skill that's needed. We need to be able to critically think about things that are happening around us, think about them in different ways and be open to being challenged like you identified and apply that in everyday circumstances. We have to engage with people. We are social beings. So having effective discussions and learning how to engage and support in safe ways is really critical. And like you indicated on that word bubble, they are, they're structured, but at the same time, they're, they're broad. And so part of an effective discussion is that we do stay on topic and we have inclusive engagement, lots of participation, but they also include social talk. And what I mean by social talk is that it has to be relevant. 
And so somebody in the word bubble put passionate. And so you have to be passionate about the subject matter and it has to include those things. So like I thought about Christmas and having those really great conversations online with my family. And in 45 minutes, I realized I had better conversations with some of them than I had normally when we would get together for big get togethers because people are disengaged, they're on their phone, they're doing their other things. But when we're having those guided, structured conversations, they become higher order and that's what we're looking for. So you're here, you want to understand how to facilitate effective discussions online. Um, so just in a quick chat, if you can post real quickly, you had your groups, you talked about what made a conversation great. What made you want to engage in that conversation? So if you can just take a quick second, I'd love to see the chat kind of run up with ideas of what allowed you to share in a great conversation? What made you engage? So does anybody have any feedback of why would you engage in a great conversation? What were the characteristics? Common interest? Absolutely. I felt seen and heard. Very important. Mutual respect for the person wanting to know what they think. Great listener. Awesome. The conversation was safe. Having good tone when speak, absolutely. Enthusiasm, the topic was interesting, really important, and we're gonna get it more into that after the break. Excitement of discovery and learning, absolutely. Non-judgmental mutual understanding, awesome. Okay, so that brings us right into um, the next part of our discussion today. So just so you know, we're gonna stay on track here we are going to talk about creating safe and inclusive spaces. So, like I said before, this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, so just by a show of hands, and we're just gonna use our little guys down here. Um, show of hands, when you've been a student in a classroom, have you ever felt uncomfortable? And Uncomfortable doesn't mean um, that you felt hurt or anything like that, but something didn't sit right with you in the classroom. So by a show of hands, if you can let me know, did you ever feel uncomfortable in a classroom? Somebody said something, it didn't sit right, um, it made you uncomfortable. <laughs> okay, awesome. So quite a few of you have. Okay. All right. Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. It, it can be just the, the topic of conversation. It might make us uncomfortable. So if you put your hands down, now I want to ask, have you ever felt unsafe in a classroom discussion? So somebody said, some, somebody said something that was biased or racist or oppressive, make comments about um, homosexuality, ableism, racism, any any of those things yeah it happens no some okay wow and again I I'm in social work and it's happened like I've, I felt uncomfortable and unsafe and again everybody's experience is going to be different absolutely so it happens and we cannot have effective discussions if we feel unsafe okay so last question for those of you who felt unsafe did a teacher or GA do anything about this to address the issue? Just by a show of hands. We, oh. So a couple people? Okay. All right, so three, all right. So some GAs or TAs have addressed it, and that's great to hear, because I'm sorry to hear when people feel unsafe and it hasn't gone addressed. Have been angry in class. And we're gonna talk about anger and, and dynamics after the break, because there's definitely 
anger can be framed in different ways and anger can come from different places. So as we talk more about socially just environments and how to create these safe inclusive spaces, we're going to talk about how those dynamics can shift into where conflict and, and challenge can actually be a really good thing. But I just want to remind you, on an online environment, it can be much harder to facilitate these safe spaces because I can't see you. I'm talking to my computer. If I was in the classroom, I could see your face, see who's engaged, see who's participating, who looks uncomfortable, and I can be familiar with who's in my classroom. But right now, I'm not. So because we're disconnected this way, this is a really key, important aspect in order to facilitate those effective discussions. So let's talk about what are socially just learning environments. So in review of the literature, again, not a clear definition of what a socially just learning environment is, but here is what I found. Um, and just so you know, the PowerPoints and resources will be made available to you. So number one, like you guys identified, students have to feel secure. They have to feel safe in the environment in order to share their opinions, in order to share their, you know, their challenge each other. Everybody has to feel safe. So discussions need to promote collaborative efforts and inclusive dialogue. And you guys already talked about that in the definition of effective discussions. So in a socially just learning environment, not one voice dominates the other. Everybody's included and everybody gets a chance to participate. And this is also about raising critical consciousness and power imbalances are addressed. And what this means is that teachers, GAs, we are not the ones there to be doing all the talking and promoting the opinions. Our job is to challenge each other to think about things differently and understand that I don't have all the knowledge, you don't have all the knowledge, but together we can create some ideas and challenge each other to think about things differently. And as a GA in social work, you need to have uncomfortable conversations. How do we ensure, for example, our white students feel safe? You are going to go, we are going to go, um, talk about that exactly next, about how do we create these safe environments. So just gonna touch on cultural humility. And when I talk about cultural humility, we're talking about um, making, understanding that where I come from, where you come from, we're different and we've had different experiences and we all have biases, we all have them, implicit biases that we are raised with because that's our society. So we need to demonstrate that we are comfortable with the fact that we are different and that we are okay with where we've come from and okay to be challenged. So we're gonna role model understanding that I may not understand where you're coming from, but I'm gonna ask about that. And why do you feel that way? And tell me more about that. So it's really critical that we engage outside of our comfort zones. We lean into some discomfort and have these uncomfortable, like you're saying, Abdul, is uncomfortable conversations. So if we think back to those great conversations, whether they were with friends or peers or colleagues, you felt safe, you felt a sense of trust, you felt you wouldn't be judged, and that you could walk away, and at the end of the day, even when your opinions were very different, you felt respected and valued and heard. And that is so important for students in order to engage in these higher order critical thinking activities, these effective discussions, that they feel safe and secure. So when we don't do this, our discussions stay at the surface level. We don't have uncomfortable discussions. We remain surface level. And then we don't ever really engage in that transfer of knowledge and that higher order thinking. So we need to create this safe environment. And so like <laughs> Abdul was asking, how do we create safe, inclusive environments? So I'm gonna turn this back on to you as a group. We're gonna do some breakout rooms again. Hopefully we can do this quickly and effectively. You're gonna have a group about four to five um, people in each group. I want you to brainstorm. 
Think about how you would do this in a regular classroom and then how does that translate online? Think about your discussions and where great conversations came from. How did you feel safe? What made you feel safe? What were the characteristics? So I'll post the question again in the chat for you. We'll take about five minutes. I do want you to have one person recording because um, we're going to bring that back to a whiteboard and we're just going to type in some ideas on how to create safe, inclusive environments because it's really important that we learn how to develop these strategies because every class is going to be different. So we're going to do the breakout rooms. Again, like I said, we're going to have about four or five people in each one. We're going to spend four to five minutes coming up with strategies, and then we're going to come back, have one person record, and put the answers on the whiteboard. You don't have to have a huge list, maybe one or two key points. Let's hopefully, as a large group, have some good insight, okay? So we're going to start this, and then I'll send a message when we've got about 15 to 30 seconds left.
mentioning something okay. about it being online. Hi everyone, welcome back. You can mute your mute microphones. Thank you for participating in the groups. And if you can, um, in the chat or on the whiteboard, post your ideas on what you came up with as a group. And if you can make, uh, for whatever reason, I chose slide colors that do not go with blue. <laughs> so if you can choose black or white font, that would be really helpful. I'm having a hard time reading the blue. Um, before any discussion, you could review a set of guidelines and the group to ensure everyone is on the same page. Absolutely. Making sure respect and kindship is always there to enable a safe overall involvement, overall environment, avoiding offensive and poten potentially controversial topics. Respect for opinions and others. Listen to all students and try to understand them, showing that you're ready to listen. I'm going to come back to, um, I'm going to make a note about the controversial topics. We're going to talk about that when we manage dynamics later on, because I think that's something that we need to have that conversation about, because controversial topics will come up. Uh, not being judgmental and giving the benefit of the doubt, absolutely. Encouraging everyone base their points and cited information, not allowing personal attacks, absolutely important about not allowing personal attacks. We're going to talk about those. Some people may not know cited information. So what do we do? Aware of microaggressions. Absolutely. That is a very important aspect is as a GA being socially aware of what the dynamics are and what people are really saying. Responding respectfully, absolutely. On day one, have the class come up with a set of class rules. That is so important. I know it might seem, um, you know, back in, you know, younger, you didn't do these things, we're in university, why would we have to do that? And it's really important for people to have expectations to be able to go into a room and know what to expect and not have anxiety. So by establishing those group norms are so important. So. We're just going to move ahead here. So creating safe and inclusive environment. Um, it's really important as a GA and as a teacher that we recognize ourselves, especially online. We have to be so much more aware of our dialogue. One of the things that I am guilty of, and I probably have already done it today, is I say the words, hey guys, all the time. And I remember being called in about it. And I couldn't stop saying it and it was so embarrassing. But we have to be humble and recognize ourselves as we're going to make mistakes and that we we understand where we're, we're learners too in this environment. And so part of recognizing a self is appropriate self-disclosure. So at the beginning, I introduced myself. I showed you pictures of my fur babies. Um, I gave you a little bit of background about me. Again, this is going to rest with you and how you're going to feel safe to disclose. But I encourage you to explore this because it's really important for your students because you're asking them to share themselves among each other. So you need to role model this. And I'm a big fan of Brene Brown. Um, so this is my one shout out to her. I have another one after the break, but being vulnerable. It's so important to be okay with being vulnerable because that's how we learn. We show students that we're open to new ideas. And with vulnerability comes humility, that you are not a gatekeeper of knowledge. You don't have all the answers. And the part of facilitating effective discussions is not to have the answers. Because if you come back with the opinion or the response, you've shut that whole conversation down and you haven't challenged students to critically think about why you're there. So it's really important that you have humility. And another really important part, and this was something I learned in my CTL class last semester, was self-care. I didn't realize how important it was to check in with students and see how they're doing, especially when the dialogue goes flat. When students aren't engaging, you need to check in and how are you doing? What is going on? Chances are there's something probably happening that they're, I mean, whether it's COVID, we're all struggling with that. Whether they have five papers due that week, checking in and asking students, I won't forget the CTL facilitator, Jessica, she said, you know, you guys aren't 
aren't engaging today. What is going on? And the whole class was silent. And she offered us an extra break. And we took it. And everyone got a coffee. And okay, we can do this. We came together collaboratively. Again, made it a safe environment to check in. My mentor always started her classes with a check-in with her students. You know, she had 20. Yeah, it took 20 minutes to check in with everyone. But by the end of that semester, they had such a good rapport with each other, they were able to talk about some really controversial topics in the class. And it made it amazing for great conversations to happen. So self-care, facilitating that humble environment, encouraging humility among your students, it's so important. And you, as a GA, what you bring to the table, you're not going to be 100% every day. And it's okay to say, guys, I am sick today. I'm not 100%. You're showing your vulnerability. People are more likely to engage, and you probably talked about this in your dialogue when you were talking about great conversations, that you felt okay to be yourself and be present. So uh, to promote further um, socially just learning environments, there's lots of frameworks about anti-oppressive and anti-racist theories that I would have loved to have gotten into, but it would have I could have made this session three days. And so I can't do that. So I've included some references on the slides if you want to look more into those types of frameworks for decolonizing pedagogies and things like that. So uh, we are definitely going to take a break. Um, it is definitely time to go and get a coffee, relax, take 10 minutes. We'll come back at 4 o'clock and we will wrap this up on time, I promise. And uh, yeah, and we're going to go into uh, promoting effective and discursive dialogues after the break.
Just going to get everybody one more minute before we uh, hit four o'clock here and get started again. This is uh, this is Abby's look after the first 24 hours we brought home Zoe. Um, <laughs> she was totally disheveled with our new puppy. And uh, yeah, definitely. What do you mean the break is over? 10 minutes goes by fast for some people. Some people it doesn't. Anyways, so we're going to get back into it and how to promote the effective and discursive discussions in an online environment. So think back to your group at the very beginning um, when you had those early conversations with people about what made a conversation great and your de definition that we created on the word cloud and what you talked about, what made a great conversation. So it was engaging. It was passionate. Um, it was about something you were interested in. It was a two-way street. It mattered to you. It was something that was important. These are all key factors for effective discussions. If it doesn't matter to the student, how do we get them to transfer that knowledge into everyday practice? So it's really important that we use those, those key strategies, those key factors, to create something that is meaningful. So, because if not, we're not going to promote that higher order learning and those critical thinking skills. So, in a virtual environment, how do we promote this? So, promoting effective discussions online. Um, why are we here? People, when they come to the classroom, need to know what is the point of being in this discussion. So, when you signed up for today's uh, 90 minute workshop, you knew you had a brief overview of what we were talking about today, and I gave you the key points. So, students need to know ahead of time why are they showing up? What is the goal or the objective of this discussion? It can be really anxiety provoking if you don't give people a heads up of what's going to be happening. If I would have sent you out into that first breakout room and didn't tell you anything other than have a conversation, it would have maybe some people, maybe not all, provoked some anxiety. But I told you, you didn't need a recorder, you're just going to have a conversation. When you can give information to people, it's going to reduce their anxiety, they're more likely to engage with you and engage in the conversation. And it's important, if you can, provide materials ahead of time. Students like to be prepared, they like to know what's coming up, and even if it's just something for them to glance over, at least they have an idea of what you're going to be discussing. As we talked about in socially just learning environments, it's really important for students to know when they show up what is expected of them. So establishing group rules and understanding the norms. What will be tolerated? What is not tolerated? What is the expectation for participation? What does it mean for you as a GA participation? Does that mean just showing up and being present? Or does it mean that they're putting things in the chat that they actually have their camera on? What does it mean? And are there marks involved with the discussion? Because what helps professors grade participation can often be very challenging for students. So if they have a clear definition of what is expected of them, so is it that they just show up? Is it that they have to meaningful participate? Well, if they have to meaningful part provide meaningful participation, what does that mean? You need to be able to put that in concrete ways so students know what is, is expected of them. So becoming prepared, preparing an argument ahead of time, having all those things, students will be more willing to engage in the process if they know what to expect. And then the most important thing for promoting effective discussions is social presence. For me, at least, it's social presence. So you have to show up as the GA. We need to show up with energy. As the teacher, you need to be passionate about what you're talking about. If I sat here and just read off my notes and didn't really engage with you, even though I'm talking to my computer, you would feel it. I love being in front of a classroom because I can walk around, I can move around, I can point, I can do things. I can't do that, but 
as you've probably been seeing, my hands are still waving. I still am trying to convey my energy and my passion about this subject to you. So it's really important that students feel that as well, even in an online presence. And that's why it's important to have your camera on as a GA, because you need to show up. And the goal of having these discussions online is having students engage and build that solid social justice environment where they feel safe to fully engage. So whether they have the technology to be present, so will they turn their cameras on? Will they use a microphone to use their voice? Will they use the chat to be present? You want to facilitate those kind of environments, those safe environments where they will effectively engage in the conversation to promote that critical thinking. So it's really, really important. I can't say how much it's important that you're passionate, especially online. So, and it's also putting an effort into your slides, into your material, and making sure that it's relevant. Because again, if it's not relevant and it's not something that students and it's passionate about that they're not passionate about, there's going to be a disconnect. So whenever topic you're discussing, if it's computer science, technology, social work, nursing, it doesn't matter. It needs to be relevant to something the students are interested in. So it needs to become a two-way street. And this is where we talk about this broad discursive dialogue. So we support and encourage interactions through scaffolding and connection to relevant contexts. So what we mean by scaffolding is that you have to recognize when you go into those online formats that the first day in there, especially with a new cohort, they don't know each other. Do you expect everybody to come and turn their cameras on? And if you go in with that expectation, are you going to get it? And are you going to get people to truly engage? Probably not. Some people are more comfortable in front of the camera and in front of in, in having those dialogues, but from being just even in a classroom, some students are reluctant to participate. So we need to scaffold that and build those confidence and build that socially justice environment so students feel safe and secure to participate. And again, connecting it to the relevant context will help them feel more engaged with what's being taught. And when you provide the scaffolding, you're role modeling what is expected from them. So it becomes a shared leadership that you're co-creating learning opportunities. So when we talked about the effectiveness of socially just environments that we're giving and taking knowledge, when students feel engaged in the conversation and they're co-creating the learning, they're more likely to participate. This is a lecture style. You're not going to, um, you're not able to participate actively in this discussion. And that, so this is not a, a real effective discussion. I'm telling you, this is what you need to do and you can take it or leave it. But when we want people to critically think about higher order um, information and apply it to day-to-day -day functioning, we need to create those opportunities for them to engage in their own learning that they want to learn. So it needs to be co-created, this environment. And we can't do that unless the environment is safe. And so throughout a semester, you're going to build in these strategies to help students feel safe. So the first day of a discussion group, you might not expect people to turn their cameras on. And that's OK. Reassure them. Respond with humility. I get it. You don't want to turn your cameras on. Figure out safe ways, and we'll talk about that next, about active learning strategies on how we can scaffold students to actively engage without forcing a face-to-face -face conversation right off the hop, because that might be really difficult. The other part that's really important to have these broad conversations is to keep changing it up. If I would have sat here and talked to you for the full 90 minutes, I mean, some people are going to not be present. Their energy is not going to be here. And I'm guilty of it. I am known to check emails, have another tab open on my computer. Some of you might be doing that right now. And it's okay. I mean, we're all human. Multitasking is something that we've gotten accustomed to. But by act using active learning strategies, 
you keep people on their toes and it helps broaden that conversation. It helps keep them engaged and it helps keep them connected. So we're constantly trying new things. So you could take an entire course on active learning strategies. So I'm just going to talk a few right now. And really, I should start at the bottom and work my way up because that's kind of the scaffolding. So an easy way to get people involved is chat polls and things like Mentimeter. So it's low risk. You get people engaged, they, they can write in the chat, they don't actually have to participate fully at that moment, but they're having a dialogue. And those word clouds in that collaboration, having a whiteboard, you're seeing how ideas are either re repeated or co contributions are added to each other. So you're really scaffolding that dialogue. The next step, discussion boards and responses. It's really an easy way to get students to engage in a discussion through a discussion board and threads. And again, having that rubrics and that expectation of what you expect in those discussion boards. How are you marking them? Do they have to cite information in these discussion boards? How long do they have to be? All of those things are really important to have the effect of discussions. Students need to know what is expected of them. But again, low risk because they not have to, they don't have to say it out loud. And if they're challenged in a thread, it's not direct, it's indirect. So it's a bit safer. So then as you start to build this rapport and the socially just learning environment, students may be more willing to engage. And then you can really start using these active learning strategies. So group activities are always great, especially if you have a small group and you can pair up and do the think, pair, share. So again, what's a great conversation? Think about it, pair up, talk about it, and then come back and share it to the group. And then you can do small group activities with five people and, and have those conversations. And that's a great way to build rapport among your students. So again, they're starting to feel safe to open up about their opinions. And then other active learning strategies, so structured and unstructured questions, problem-based learning or uh, inquiry-based learning, I personally love. You come up with a question and you ask people to solve it, or you ask the students to come prepare to the class with a, with a question, and then you help them come up with the answer. So again, it's really about finding different ways to promote a discussion. Case studies are always it brings that relevant context to the classroom. So what's happening in society right now that relates to what you're teaching? How can you tie that in? You know, whether it's about COVID, whether it's about um, air pollution, whether it's social work and the anti-black racism movement, it, it, all of those things, um, bring that into your classroom because it's relevant, it's going to create dialogue. And finally, the Socratic method, is simply asking questions. So recognizing that, that you don't have all the answers, but also taking the students and what they say and then asking a question about it. Well, you think this, so let's talk about it the other way. And it doesn't mean you agree or disagree with them. And the way I've done this, even in marking papers, to create that discussion and dialogue, is I tell students ahead of time, I will put in your paper just a thought. And by indicating just the thought, it doesn't mean I'm criticizing. It's just presenting another way of thinking about it. So they'll have an opinion, and I'll put just a thought. Did you think about it this way? It's not something that I'm trying to be critical. It's trying to promote critical thinking and that transfer of learning. And it opens them up to that higher order thinking. So what somebody had brought up before about controversial subjects and how do we make people feel safe and how do we deal when things go awry and i you guys can tell that i'm obsessed with my animals and here's zoe looking at abby abby looks ferocious she really isn't and uh you said what and it's going to happen and you want it to happen in your classroom because when you have dynamics and you have challenging topics, this is when you get a chance to really engage in effective discussions because it's going to promote higher order learning. But you can't have these unless you, students know what is the re why are we having these discussions? What is an effective discussion? We're feeling safe. 
and you scaffold them to, to engage in a conversation online. So again, it takes time to get to this point, but when it does happen, you've got to be comfortable with the uncomfortable conversations and be able to be a leader amongst the students because that is your role. It's about facilitating effective online discussions. It's not leading them, it's facilitating. So this is my second shout out to Brene Brown. Um, daring leaders are never silent about hard things. So this is really important. When you're in the classroom, it's controversies are gonna happen. Controversial subjects will be brought up because these are things that are real life. So what do we do about them? If we ignore them, we are actually contributing to other microaggressions or oppressions. So when they do get brought up because and it's not to say that you need to bring them up, but if a student brings it up, how do we go from there? And so if you've created a socially just environment with group norms and expectations and rules where you've shown vulnerability and humility, you will be able to say something in order to make sure everybody else remains safe and that you can address it that promotes education, that promotes leadership, and that promotes critical thinking. You're not there to shut down the opinion. You're there to guide, lead in a socially just way, role model vulnerability in order to learn from each other. So how do we do that? How do we be these leaders and not just take over the conversation and shut down learning? So it's really about managing dynamics. And that's why I want to get away from that word about conflicts and controversies. Because if we manage dynamics, we manage with empathy. So when somebody says something that is a microaggression, that is racist, that is oppressive, we, if we respond with empathy, we take away that, that power of what somebody said because you come from a place that maybe they don't know what they said was racist. Maybe they don't understand that it was hurtful. So if we respond not with anger, but with empathy, we can take a step back and use that moment and that momentum to demonstrate, to role model vulnerability, humility, and facilitate a really effective discussion about where that conversation is going. Now, like was said before, we gotta stay always on topic. So I always keep a sticky note next to my computer to remind me what are we there for and how do I tie back in uh, what we're there for. But you can't ignore these controversial subjects. So when you act with empathy, using I statements. So I hear you saying this, does anybody else have an opinion? Because you don't want to take away the, the energy. You don't want to take away the power in the room. You want the dynamics to be free flowing. You want the students to engage with each other and contribute to each other's knowledge base. So again, opening up that dialogue. It's really important not to call out people and shame them about their opinions. Because like I said, I don't know what your experience has been. I don't know what you've been through and you don't know my experience. So we don't know how we've been raised and whether what we've experienced together. So when we come to the classroom, we want to call in. And when there's a microaggression, when there's racism or when there's something that goes and it's conflict or it's somebody gets angry and it's a really challenging environment, take a break, respond with empathy and call in. So identify with the student that, hey, I hear you saying this. I wonder if you can tell me more about your opinion, what's happening, or ask other people, what do you guys think? And again, by using a gentle approach, you're allowing an effective discussion. That's not to say allow racism or um, oppressive comments to continue. If you have to, you have to shut it down. But allowing the students to engage with each other, to challenge each other is your first job. And if you've constructed a socially just environment, you've established those norms of what will be tolerated and what won't be. And then hopefully that translates into managing dynamics where it's working with empathy, working with refraining from generalizations where you can reflect back to students. So I'm hearing you say this, this is, 
can anybody else talk to me about that? So I know somebody had posed a question in the chat earlier about making um, racialized students feel comfortable or white students feel comfortable. It's about being able to call in. And so if somebody says, no, I'm, I'm not good with this, call them in because we all have biases. And so again, if you've been humble and self-reflective and you've addressed your own vulnerability, and you respond with empathy. I can see where maybe you're coming from because you've had that experience. Can somebody else tell me about theirs? You've just managed to take what could be a conflict into a perfect opportunity to have an effective discussion that's gonna create critical consciousness, collaboration, co-sponsored learning, all of those things to have effective conversations that lead to higher order learning and thinking and promotes that lifelong ability to have these great dialogues. So I love this picture. It's the storm and the rainbow. Conflicts are beneficial. They promote a broader mindset. It's just a simple uh, quote that I took from one of the, uh, the references. Again, I'm not a huge fan of even using the word conflict, but it really is. Conflicts can be beneficial. Dynamics, challenging dynamics can be beneficial as long as we respond in a way that we're brave, that we do not let things slide. And at the end of the day, if you do have to talk to a student privately, you have to talk to a student privately. Use your professor if you're a GA or a TA. Um, and again, those things can be established in group norms of how you're going to deal with things that way. So students know that this is a safe environment, that things that are said that get shut down will get talked about later as well, so that they know that racism or things that are controversial don't just get shut down and ignored. That is not what we're about. We're about promoting social justice. We're about promoting higher order thinking and critical. Something good comes out of the bad. Absolutely. That's exactly my point. There, I guess you could, you could probably tell that I'm a social worker just by the way I'm talking, but absolutely, there is always an opportunity to have something good come out of the, the negative or the hard conversations. And so it's a really scary thing. One of the things Brene Brown says is lean into the discomfort. And that's a really hard thing to do. It's not easy, but recognize that if you are humble and you recognize that you, you're not perfect, it'll make it so much easier. So um, we're getting to the end. Um, I did have one more exercise, but I think that uh, we're going to be wrapping up. Um, I don't know why my slides aren't letting me click over now. Well, this is a good one to end on. It really is. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to post the feedback form in the chat for everybody? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So um, anyways, I had one more slide. I don't know why it froze. It's just technology today. It's telling me it's time to wrap up. Anyways, so the biggest thing about facilitating effective discussions online, number one, go into the classroom and make sure your students know why effective discussions are important. So what are they learning from them? Because a lot of the time students attend tutorials, things like that, and they don't quite understand why they're there, right? And we, we just have to talk about this. Explain to them that discussions help you learn, and that's what we're doing. Um, that this socially just environment is key to promoting these effective discussions. I can't say that enough. People have to feel safe. This day and age, um, with everything that's happening around us, all the experiences that are happening, we need to make sure students feel safe. And so establishing uh, a safety a safe environment that you construct that scaffold to their needs, you're going to have a better chance of really effective discussions. Um, identify the goals of the discussions, what is expected, and apply active learning strategies. So just asking students to show up week to week and just sit and talk, it might get redundant. It may not. You might have a group who are really actively engaged, but don't be afraid to use case studies, to use problem-based learning or inquiry-based learning. Um, all those references at the end of the slides will be available to you to look them up and, and have a look and see what could apply to you. And then, or use polls or things like that to get the conversation started. And then finally, like 
Daryl pointed out, something good comes out of the bad. Conflict and discursive dialogue are to be encouraged and don't shy away from it and don't shut it down. Allow students to respond to each other, stay out of their way and let them learn and co-create those opportunities. And you'll have, you'll see that effective discussions can be really evident in that online format. So I do appreciate everybody being here today. It's about 424. So Elizabeth's going to post that link um, for the feedback. And um, that I would really appreciate for everyone to fill out the feedback. This is my first time presenting. So any feedback you can give me to improve is really helpful. Um, I appreciate your patience with the technology. It was a, a little trying at the beginning, but I really do appreciate everybody. And uh, I think Elizabeth, um, will it just be posted under um, this session, those slides for everybody to look at? I, I'm not sure how that works, but. Yeah, so, um, so the, the feedback form link is in the chat. Um, so as Natalie suggested, we would really appreciate some feedback. Um, and you can anticipate a follow-up email coming probably within the next hour, I would say, and that would include a link to the recording. Um, and Natalie, if you want to share those those PowerPoint slides with me, then I can also share that via email as well. And um, we'll also include a link to the feedback form in that email. Awesome, okay. I've got a few minutes here if anybody has any questions or anything else they want to post in the chat. If not, um, have a wonderful afternoon and take care of yourselves and stay safe.